Hello. Welcome to the Butterfly Process Discussion Series, an opportunity for community learning and dialogue. My name is Rebecca Kirk, and I'm the Director of Community and Learning for Boston Lyric Opera. Happy International Women's Day. Today's session will be 90 minutes. Symbolism and Archetypes of Women explores the cultural context of the geisha in Japan as it relates to the character of Chocho-san in Madama Butterfly and how the depictions of this character have perpetuated many different stereotypes of Asian and AAPI women in American culture. Bill Chan will lead this conversation with our featured speakers today, Taya Kasahara, Yuna Lee, and Giselle T to contextualize these themes and frame a community discussion with BLO artists who are engaged with us for this year-long process. As a community guest, you're with us virtually today. Your role is very important. We invite you to watch, listen, and hold space for these important conversations. I'd like to invite you to take a deep breath in and slowly release it, grounding in this present moment. We each come here today as people holding multiple identities from many different places together in this virtual space. At Boston Lyric Opera, we live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts peoples. We recognize that colonization of these lands continues to affect the original inhabitants after more than 400 years. I invite you to, if you haven't already done so, read and acknowledge our community agreements. They were provided on the slides at the beginning of this event, included in your confirmation information and are always available on our website. We are providing them in the chat now for your reference. These community agreements are created to support all of us today and hold a safe space even though we can't see each other. Thank you for honoring these agreements today. We acknowledge that the content of this discussion series may be sensitive to some. We encourage you to participate and engage to the extent in which you're most comfortable. BLO has partnered with the AWARE Lab at the Boston University School of Social Work, and they have generously shared resources for our community to seek additional support, particularly those who identify as AAPI and BIPOC. You can find the link to these resources on our website. There's an opportunity for our speakers to get questions from you through the submission on our Q&A feature. We, na we may not or may not have time to answer all the questions submitted. We've enabled the closed captioning feature today as well, and you may choose to hide or show it by clicking on the icon next to the Q&A feature. Additional information about the butterfly process, including bios of our featured speakers can be found on blo.org. If you missed the first three discussions in the series, you may watch them anytime for free on operabox.tv. This session will also be available to stream in a couple weeks. Thank you for being with us here today. And now I will invite Phil and our featured speakers to begin today's discussion. Hi everybody, welcome. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so today we're gonna talk about archetypes and stereotypes within Madama Butterfly. Um, I think as a, a creative, as, as somebody who works on librettos and, and creates stories, one of the things that we try to do um, is to connect what an audience has um, about certain people, certain certain characters, whether that's a, maybe a princess or a sailor, um, or, or sometimes um, a whole group of people. Maybe it's a Chinese person or an Italian person. You know, so we just recognize that audiences come into our theaters with some of these ideas. So. Uh, our job as artists is to both play into those or play against those to create a, a, an emotional response. So um, Butterfly specifically is one of those works that has a few different layers uh, for it. So um, wanted to bring together this diverse group of, of folks on our panel um, because they, they all come at it from a slightly different perspective. And we're gonna look at three different sort of major archetypes or symbols that come up in the opera. So the first is, is Asian folks. We're gonna look at, at the men and how they're portrayed, but also this sort of geisha stereotype. 
Um, and we've, we've talked a lot about that already in, in our previous sessions about Orientalism, um, as well as the history of butterflies. So there's some tangents there that are, are interesting already. Um, we're also going to talk about um, just in general, the place of women, both in this opera, as well as um, in other Puccini operas and opera in general, um, just to question what are we doing um, when we perform this particular work within this larger context. Um, and then finally, as Americans, um, we're also going to examine the role of Americans in, in the opera as well. Um, and, and that's something that, that is sort of interesting to, to remember that Puccini was Italian and, and Americans were probably just as different and exotic as, as Japanese people. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our panelists today. Um, and then uh, we can start talking about, and you know, super casual, but, but just uh, start chatting about some of these archetypes. So Giselle, why don't we start with you? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Giselle T and I am a theater and opera director. Uh, I most recently directed uh, BLO's Return to Live Opera, uh, at the Cavalleria Rusticana at the, um, in October. And uh, my relationship with Puccini is one of a uh, cautious and curious art maker, I think. Um, I, I uh, haven't worked on Madame Butterfly, and I was telling the group yesterday that I didn't actually want to come near it, or I was really res uh, hesitant to talk about it. Um, but uh, in terms of my progress with Puccini, I would say uh, maybe three years ago I was a Puccini atheist, and now I'm sort of an agnostic. So I, you know, still, still curious, but with a critical eye on on the work. Great, lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Taya? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Taya Kasahara and my pronouns are they, them. I'm a Nikkei Canadian settler, Japanese of uh, Japanese heritage here in uh, Toronto, Toronto, Canada. Um, the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Wendat peoples um, and the Mississaugas of the credit. Um, I'm an opera singer, a theater maker and a co-founder of Amplified Opera. And my relationship to Butterfly um, started a few years ago, actually, um, when I first sang it in concert with the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. Um, and as I was learning that role, I wanted to also just learn about the Japanese melodies that were appropriated. And so that led me down um, a really beautiful path to research and um, meeting different scholars and working to elevate those melodies in Japanese alongside the Puccini. Um, and I'm working on this project, which is an ongoing iterative project called the Butterfly Project, The Ballad of Chocho Sun, which um, just released its first video a couple weeks ago. Thanks. Great. And Yuna. So I sang Butterfly uh, in BLO's last production 10 years ago, and I've sung this role over 170 times around the world. And my relationship with this opera, I have a love and hate relationship, I guess. And um, Puccini uh, has been the co first composer of the opera that I ever sang as a student, graduate student in New York, the Sor Angelica. My second opera was Mimi, and my last opera was Butterfly. So I am pretty <laughs> bonded with Puccini. And I was born and grew up in South Korea and moved to the US about 30 years ago. So I'm the first generation of Korean American. And now I'm in Arizona, teaching at the University of Arizona. I'm teaching voice and opera now. Nice Fabulous. So we have we have some folks from across the the spectrum of um, of coming to this work. Um, so I wanted to just hear from you guys. Um, you know, in general, when we think of of these archetypes that are in in place, why don't we start with thinking about some of the Asian representations. So, you know, as we talked about in the, the previous sessions, um, Puccini did have some exposure to authentic Japanese culture. There is quite a bit of Japanese folk music uh, in the opera, but it's still uh, very much based on this, this Madama Chrysanthemum and then this, this David Belasco play that was so influential about defining um, sort of, you know, this geisha fantasy. Um, so I would love to hear from, from you guys as, as people who've embodied this role about what that preparation was like and, and what, is, what is it like to actually perform this role? Yes, yeah, so like I mentioned, I was born and grew up in Korea and moved here 
uh, as an adult. So when I first entered uh, this opera and when I first uh, performed this role, uh, nothing really was very strange to me. So my problem I say usually is, has been um, that I have not had too many problems with this opera. And I have been learning a lot lately about a lot of issues that I had not thought of before. Um, the reason that I felt really familiar with all these characters in the opera, especially Cho Cho San was because um, when I uh, was in Korea, I learned about America from a TV show called Little House on Prairie. Um, so that was uh, how I, built my American dream. I thought um, it's somewhat very different, but looked amazing to me. <laughs> so when I first came to the US, I went to Boston first and then moved to New York the next year. So it was quite different. So um, when I sing, for example, the lines of, um, you know, Cho Cho Sanz, when she says, um, when she first met Pinkerton, she says, um, you're so tall and strong and handsome and you laugh. So convincingly and all that. I could relate to what she really said because that's how I, that was very close to how I felt about um, American people uh, during the first time, like, you know, when I interacted with Americans. And um, you can always interrupt me if I am um, going too long, but there's this concept called sadejui. I tried to find a translation of this word in English, but it doesn't exist. It's a concept of, um, it comes from um, inferiority complex of your own culture. So you look up to another culture, in this case, Western cult culture too much. So in other words, Western people cannot do anything wrong. So we worshiped, we sort of exalt, my husband said this word would be very appropriate, exalting other cultures. So in her idea, everything Pinkerton did was right. So she had this fantasy and she um, uh, fell in love with this idea of fantasy of America and she decided to marry this man. Although I believe she knew what she was going into because it, on the original Russia Virgin, which I happened to sing one time, she says that I have been fantasizing about um, marrying someone for some time. So she knew this was a temporary contract too, I believe. So, and other, other issues like suicide and, you know, that um, sadly, unfortunately, that suicide rate is uh, still very high in my country in South Korea. And not too long ago, one of our former presidents um, committed suicide out of uh, some dishonorable dis uh, conduct that his family was caught for. So that concept I could also understand very easily. And, um, you know, in uh, Joseon Dynasty in Korea, 15th or 16th century, um, Korean noble women were supposed to carry a small silver knife uh, so they can use um, in an emergency if they have um, an urgent, uh, they're in a, a situation where they could be raped, then they were supposed to use that, uh, you know, instead of getting raped by strangers. So that concept was always um, familiar with me. And about the, uh, the baby, the baby decision, after the Korean War in 1953, you know, there were so many interracial babies in Korea and they were not accepted very well by the Korean society at the time. So a lot of those babies were sent for adoption uh, to America and that interracial uh, marriage, interracial babies uh, issue is still uh, somewhat uh, problematic in Korea. So I believe, um, both Cho Cho San and Kate Pinkerton or, or other people did the best thing, the best thing they thought it was for the baby and for the mother. It sounds like there's some uh, complicated truths that uh, the opera brings to the surface that might not relate to that specific story, but that we have echoes of in other areas of our society. And maybe that's why this work um, resonates uh, in, in, in some way. Um, yeah, any, anybody else? 
I would say thank you for teaching us the word. I love the words that can't be translated. I think those are the words that we, we learn a lot from. And I would say to that, um, I don't know exactly what the nuances of that word are in Korean, but the idea of Western superiority isn't something that comes automatically to a culture. I think it's something that's imposed on them most often when we see instances of that in colonial history. Uh, and when I think of the effect that has, you know, maybe particularly on women, how that affects the standard of, of beauty, you know, in many countries in former colonized places where there were Spanish, where there were French, where there were British, where there were Americans, their skin whitening uh, products everywhere. Um, and uh, I, I remember watching a speech by, for example, Lupita Nyong'o, who said that, you know, beautiful actress, she said that when she was a kid, she would wake up every day and pray to God that she would be uh, whiter. Um, so I think that reality is something that uh, people all over the world are living with, and it is not a natural thing. It, it took hundreds of years for them to come to that. So in, if, there's, if there are these stereotypes out there, these archetypes that inform our decisions and, and how we view ourselves, is, is there a way to use um, an opera like Madame Butterfly to question some of those, those tropes? I know like, like Taya, for example, is doing this with her, with her, her butterfly process and, and some of those conversations. Yeah, definitely. I feel like because I came to butterfly uh, later in my life, like even though I knew of the opera as a, as a teenager and through my studies, um, I never engaged with it. I never listened to it because it just felt so foreign even though it is about a japanese story of uh, this japanese geisha um and it was it was also a, a role that was out of my fach at the moment or at that time and so i feel like a, a lot of what i'm what i have brought to my version of butterfly or even just learning cho cho san the role is is bringing in a lot of relationship of this like contemporary context or, or the lens or just my body like being trans and being non binary and. Um, investigating or reflecting on my past and my experience of womanhood of girlhood of exotification in the industry. Or just as a person when I was more feminine presenting when. I was closeted and all those kinds of things and um, those experiences, I think my own personal experiences, bringing that in um, to give, I don't know, maybe greater meaning to the portrayal of Cho Cho San or in a, in a dramatic context or even in a more reflective kind of cerebral place. So I'll say that for now. I have more, but I'll save that for now. Yeah, can you can you share specifically what that actually looks like in, in practice? Um, you know, maybe just co comparing to how maybe Yuna might prepare for this similar role. Mm -hmm. I think, well, as I was preparing for Cho Cho San, I was covering it actually at the Canadian Opera Company just this past winter, but um, we didn't have a stage production because of the rise of Omicron here in Toronto. So um, as, I, as I was preparing that, um, I felt like it was more of a healing process personally for me to be able to take on this role or imagine that I would, that I would be performing this role as I'm, as I'm rehearsing it, as I'm getting into the character, um, in that I can reclaim it with, with the body that I live in every day. And then knowing that this is, this is drama, this is stage and that the pressures that I have put on myself or that I have felt from the industry during my career, um, I was able to kind of let that go or heal, heal from, you know, past traumatic experiences within the industry based on my, based because, based on my gender or my gender presentation at the time or my, um, also my race and my um, exotic look, I guess, at the time. So, it was much more an internal uh, process that was going on for me 
and to be able to really focus, I think, more on the music and uplifting, up, uplifting this character in a way that um, could be more separated from my past self. Where, where do you think are, are some places, and this is just a question for anybody, where do you, do you think are the are places where um, Puccini sort of reinforces an, an Asian-ness that doesn't feel familiar? And where are places where you feel like he might've gotten it right? I know Yuna gave a couple examples already. Well, Puccini, um, who has never been to Japan or who has probably never interacted with any uh, Japanese person at that time, um, I mean, he had sources, indirect sources, and he did his best, but there are obviously a lot of errors, uh, right, of not really understanding um, the culture. For example, there, like religion mix, mixing up uh, is there, like Buddhism and Shintoism are mixing, mixed up, so they're calling wrong names for <laughs> Buddhist gods and uh, using Shintoist gods and, and all, all that. And, some words, also the region names and all that kind of um, misunderstanding. And also, uh, I always um, questioned about, we're, we're going to talk about Asian, Asian ma male characters in the opera too, but I always uh, questioned uh, about the way Puccini put those Asian ma ma male characters and the way that he did uh, came probably have come from some ignorance uh, because, because those Asian male characters to me are very smart people, uh, respectful uh, people. I mean, in a one by one, Goro, very savvy businessmen dealing with the foreign you know, soldiers and maybe officers all the time, probably was very skilled. And uh, yeah, Majori, a rich, powerful man, and also, you know, Bundo, respected a Buddhist monk. But the way uh, they are portrayed in the opera are a little too silly and more than necessary. And um, a language they use um, is not very intelligent. And also, another mistake that I always see is a Bonzo calling Cho Cho San, Cho Cho San. San makes uh, you know, uh, honorific, so the uncle would not call her his niece that way. And that kind of thing, and the way uh, Bonzo uh, moves around usually um, is a little too um, unnecessarily silly. And, you know, Bonzos don't have to move like a sumo wrestlers, I believe. And those kind of things, uh, I think, ca probably came from his inexperience um, at the time. Yeah, and I also wonder, um, you know, it's great that we're talking about what might be problematic in the opera, but I think there's also a huge discussion about what's problematic in performance practice. And we, I, I think, I, you know, I told Phil the other, other day, it feels like a bad game of telephone operator. Oh, I've seen this company do, do it that way, who might have actually consulted Japanese people. And then it's copied and copied and copied until it's so far away from even a, a well, vaguely well-researched uh, reality. So um, if I were to approach the piece or what I would be interested in seeing from a lot of other people is like boiling down to the essence of what are the differences between the cultures that Puccini is seeing. I think with, with, the, with the Japanese side, maybe if we are to say that one thing that Puccini does get right is this, connection that the characters have both to their past and and laterally to a, a wider family whereas we see in the Pinkerton is sort of a lone ranger who has no no ties um, and and what is something with a deep culture a connection with their gods versus one where it's about uh, maybe money or conquest so uh, yeah I think th those might be interesting but instead of just focusing on the outside details of what do we think this Japan might have looked like, like or what do we think Japan looked like and, and asking people to, to imitate body gestures, how can we focus more on the kernels of, of what the experience of the characters are uh, and find something deeper? I think that would be more interesting overall. It's almost like, um, I think we, we would see the, the community, you know, like the Japanese as a community and Pinkerton as an individual 
um, sort of it's a very sort of Asian versus you know individualistic American approach. Um, and I think that's something that maybe we can see, like how much of this is Puccini writing this and how much of this are we grafting on as like, oh, these are some you know, cultural truths that we see that, that frame how we view this work. What do you guys think? I think that because this opera is so well known and is you know one of the top 10 operas performed all the time for the past 115 or so years um that it it really um it does it 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 acts as a detriment to to not only japanese culture but to asian culture kind of as a whole and painting it as this kind of monolith this uh this monolith of this caricature that all of these the, all of these characters are reinforcing that are that are in the opera and that it kind of can be dismissed as just something very other and it I, f I feel like it it reinforces this like white supremacy that that is, is 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 pervasive in our in our culture in our patriarchy that is just is um and so when we don't like this telephone operator thing that you were saying, Giselle, when we don't um, take the time to to have an honest look of what is culturally correct, what isn't correct, how can we portray this opera again in a in a safer, in a more uh, respectful way, then it continues the stereotype of how people who don't who aren't Asian or don't know other Asians um and continues to depict them like as a very kind of like otherness below us foolish you know thing so it's it's frustrating because yeah the opera is performed a lot and it's beautiful music there's no doubt about that like that's my opinion but um yeah it's very complicated Maybe can we use a specific example in that opera? Can we look at just the geisha, for example, that archetype of the geisha? Um, where else does it appear in society? I mean, even Katy Perry does it in her her set these days. You know, um, like what wh what is that symbol about? What is it saying about Asian women? And and um, who like what what what's that about? Can can you guys unpack that a little bit for us? I think one interesting element of the geisha. I saw a 14 minute video on Arte yesterday about the geisha. And it, it said that it, it first started with, with men who were functioning like troubadours. And then it transitioned to, to women who saw what was being done in the theaters and brought that into sort of the restaurants and tea houses, uh, sort of imitated that. And, and then throughout different periods in history, the aspect that sort of dealt with selling their body was was in and out, depending on what was happening culturally in Japan at the time. But uh, the documentary said that the word geisha actually means someone who the person, a person who excels in the mastery of their art. So I think when we have the cartoon image of geisha without going deeper into what it means, we don't realize, okay, what is the art behind it? They they have to learn uh, instruments. They spend they spend a lot of their time learning instruments. They learn the art of conversation. Um, they, they, their, their clothing is very elaborate and it uh, takes a long time to tie and it takes artisans to build it, not to justify the prostitution part of it, but um, remembering that there is an art uh, that, that, that goes behind it. But I think on, on the flip side, what happens when that art gets cheapened and people only see the the ownership i think what, there was one telling moment when i was you know really trying to go through the text uh with a fine tooth comb when pinkerton says you're mine whereas whereas um chucho san says you are for me and i feel like that sort of grammatically is very very different um he repeats that you're mine so so to him the the woman is an object it's property uh whereas to her it it's part of a relation. So I think that's something that's uh, important to think about too, is when, when a woman becomes property, why is that the case? What conditions make that possible? Um, yeah, and, and how does that it still exist uh, and, in different and maybe, forms today? And maybe it's not bad that Puccini is 
talking about this. Maybe he's making a statement that, you know, saying, hey, look at this situation. I think it's just the question maybe like as creatives today, are we staging Madame Butterfly with that awareness and with trying to make sure the audience gets that? Or are we just glossing over it and saying it's a love story? You know, like if, if you can consciously get the audience to see the difference right away in that relationship, um, does the tragedy change, you know? So, so um, I, I'm, I'm curious though about this larger idea of this geisha. Um, it, it does, has the geisha become a stand-in for all Asian women? Um, you know, like, is that a, yeah, like how, how, what is the weight of that geisha image on actual Asian women? Um, uh, the geisha concept also existed in Korea uh, in the, um, in the historically in ancient time. And there were, again, a very highly skilled artists and they were supposed to be very well educated and knew a lot about politics and everything in order to be able to talk with a high class, a man, male. And whether they uh, their bodies or not, I think uh, was their, their choice, I believe. It was not forced. So this concept of geisha, I think even in Japan after the you know two wars I think that concept got really blurry uh, it was so a bit, there they became one other a concept of this um, low class geisha who does everything selling the body and selling everything else so that concept is um, unfortunately damaging to Asian women, because we've heard so many stories of this, um, you know, highly educated Asian uh, women traveling around the world and, you know, being mistaken for, you know, massage therapists or whatever the prostitutes. So that concept is definitely a very um, damaging. Go ahead, Taya. Just echoing, echoing what both Giselle and Yuna have said, you know, it, this stereotype still exists in, in our modern day and um, how I've been viewed at a certain point in my life, how, how others are continued to be viewed, you know, in the media, in, in film and TV that we see on the stage. So it, it's still there, it's still being perpetuated. And so it's important to look at that. When I was thinking about this over the last uh, week or two, my sort of scavenger hunt was to find the the possible realities that make these stereotypes possible. Um, and, you know, I think everybody's heard of uh, prostitution in, in tourism, uh, a lot of Westerners specifically from, from Europe, America and Australia go to places in Thailand, for example, uh, and, uh, and also the history of military men who have gone through various bases all over um, Southeast Asia. Uh, when you think of the impact of that, if you count the number of tourists per year who consume women, let's say, or or buy women or have the ability to buy women um, and the number of, of soldiers who've gone through that, you think that's a whole generation of, of maybe millions of people who see a certain body type and associate it with something that they can buy quite easily. And even today, you know, there are many websites that, that I unfortunately sifted through and, and were pretty repulsed by where, you, where men who have experience finding women will list how you find young men, how you find young women, how you find where you find them, how you negotiate. And there are even, even tips like make sure that she knows that she's nothing when you negotiate with her, make sure she knows that she's not special or people from this nationality, they'll say are lazy. So you have to negotiate before. So really treating it like a commodity. And, and I would say, you, you know, in, the, in Pinkerton's worst version, probably in the original, they softened him up a bit. Um, I, I think many of those people exist who don't see uh, these women as women. They're, they're objects, they're toys, they're sources of pleasure. And I think in a way, it's just a way to maybe enact what they're not able to enact in their home space where they're meant to be respectable or their partners are respectable. They can go away and behave the way they do 
and treat people worse than they would in their home space and, and feel powerful. And, and then the bigger question is that why are there economic realities that make this kind of relationship that's so uh, imbalanced? How is that possible? Uh, why should someone be able to buy someone for a night for two or three dollars? Uh, that's, yeah, and that's pretty shocking when you think about it, but if you think about the multiply all the bases, all the tourist centers, and you can see why maybe uh, those kind of stereotypes persist. Okay, yes. so so oh, oh, just just to, to challenge that idea though, so it's, I'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing, but is it problematic to portray that on stage? I mean, Pinkerton is after all, not a sympathetic character, um, and so, we are making a judgment call by, by seeing, you know, Pinkerton's actions as something that we don't necessarily want to ascribe to. But isn't that okay? Like, isn't it okay to have villains that are bad guys? Like, isn't that the point? So what, what, why, is, uh, why is that archetype maybe harmful? Or, or you know, why, is that, why, why, does, perpetu why does that perpetuate um, harm against women if we're showing that it's, it's bad? What do you guys think? I think one reason might be because we we have the expectation that the tenor in opera that is paired with the soprano is is the love interest and going to fall in love and that we should be rooting for that relationship or those characters. Um, so it feels conflicting there. I don't think there are many operas where we are supposed to not cheer for the tenor who is going his who is, you know, trying to find his love in the soprano, in the lead soprano. So that's one thing that came to mind. And I, Giselle, I know you had something on the tip of your tongue. Oh, I think the responsibility is, is in the creative team. You have to frame it very deliberately so that it is a, a critique of Pinkerton, or if, if the production chooses to do so, a critique, a harsh critique of American culture. And I think the, the trap uh, in, in the States, of course, is that everyone knows American culture, everyone lives American culture or North American culture, and it's easy to step into. What is distant is the Japanese culture, so that becomes a sort of vague caricature that becomes stage, but you have to look at yourselves with the same critical eye and distance and, and recognize your own weirdnesses. And I think when you're looking at Pinkerton, um, and in, instead of just treating him as, as he will seem more like a normal person if he's played by an American person to an American audience. And, and maybe one way to handle it is to, if you're going with the with this stereotype or caricature, how can you make Pinkerton even more or uh, vice versa by, by really fine tuning both sides, but just remembering that you have to look at, look at it from the outside, both, both the American culture and the Japanese. So one time uh, in a production, um, my director, our director uh, wanted to make the bad really bad. So he, uh, he added another short scene before the overture. So we had a brothel scene. So all the geishas were lined up in nightgowns and Pinkerton and other Navy officers were choosing uh, which woman to go with. So I personally really didn't agree with the idea, but uh, the purpose was to make um, the contrasting emotional result at the end stronger. So in that case, using uh, an archetype or a stereotype to push, push the dramatic boundaries of what was actually in the work. So I, we, we also started to, to touch on um, you know, both Americans and, and women, so we could go in either direction, but maybe let's talk first a little bit more about the Americans in this opera. So we, we are in North America. Um, we do have a lot closer familiarity with, you know, American culture. We, we have some varying degrees of self-reflection that we can do as Americans about our own imperialism. And, and um, but, you know, here is an Italian person a hundred years ago you know, calling us out on on being these sort of imperialist folks. Um, how do how what's your experience about how the Americans have been portrayed and dealt with in 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 this work? I don't have an answer to that, Phil. But when I was um, you know, I I purposefully 
never watched a full production just because I like to have a tabula rasa for the for the operas in case I ever ever have to work on them. But I did just to inform myself to see how people were being portrayed, how people were being instructed to move, did a little tour of different productions that were available online, a lot of them based in Europe. And um, I know a lot of singers don't like to perform Robert Wilson's things, but I actually thought, okay, how interesting to see Robert Wilson uh, and Puccini because they seem so opposite, like a very sparse and contained um, uh, movement language with Puccini's very emotive music. And I thought what was really interesting is one, he's had a history of painting everybody white um, in, in his past work. And so he's not doing yellow face in, in Madame Butterfly when he uh, attacks it, that he's just, that's his artistic practice. And the clips that I watched, what was interesting is without imitating gestures of Japan by condensing the uh, physical vocabulary of the singers and giving them very specific movement, you actually got something that to me resembled a re sort of like restraint and intensity of emotion that I had not seen before. And I thought um, interesting in creating a more fantastical world without uh, the kind of pitfalls that you might find in representing the exotic. Because I mean, I think one of the things with, you know, Orientalist works specifically is the idea of spectacle, right? Like we love to, we, we can tell stories that take place somewhere else that aren't constrained in our reality. Cause our reality is dirty. You know, we're, we're going through the industrial revolution, you know, or whatever. It's, it's just reality, mundane. It's not, it's not anything special, but you know, some exotic Japan, you know, there could be tea houses on every corner. You know, everybody is wearing silk kimonos. You know, it's just larger than real life that we have here in Europe or in America. So um, to, to give a treatment of an orientalist work um, in sort of a, a different style than just grand spectacle, I think also questions some of these ideas and archetypes about people and place and you know what are stories that can and can't happen. Um, I'd really love to hear from anyone who's you know gotten notes from directors like what are some really either upsetting or frustrating notes that you've gotten that might have to do with what they perceive how a Japanese woman is meant to move or to be or to feel. Actually, you know, I might take a, a pause here um, and bring in some of our invited artists. I know it's a little early for them, but I think that's a question that some of them can, can answer as well. So we have a, a couple from the butterfly process who are joining us today, but I think Yuna had, a, had one she can kick us off. But um, if any of the other invited artists wanna answer that question too, I know you guys have some, some things to share, but Yuna, go ahead. Well, uh, whenever I uh, have to kneel down all the way to the ground, um, that I always had a question whether it was necessary for, uh, for the culture at that time. That's um, uh, exaggerated um, uh, respect uh, for Americans uh, from the geishas and Japanese people. And um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to start with. Uh, so we, we can hear from other artists as well. Some of the things I've been asked to do, and these were also in concert portrayals, um, even before I did the full, the full role, but asking for very uninformed, stereotypical movements of, of maybe what you would see in odori, like Japanese dance. So using the hands in a certain way, really and this is often my problem because i'm five eight so sometimes the tenors are my height or shorter than me um so to just make oneself as small and as short and as diminutive as possible and that sacrifice like then the vocalism the whole the whole body is sacrificed in order to be singing this giant role and so it's also yes we're wanting to to create kind of this fantasy of the original production as best as we can. But when you're in a concert production and when you're in the 21st century, when we are Americans or Canadians or Europeans putting on this role uh, or performing performing these, these, these parts, um, it just doesn't make sense to completely support that stereotype and, and make other, like compromise other parts of performance just for the kind of look of it. Thank you. 
Um, so Yuna and I go way back to like 2009, which was my uh, one of my very first uh, full productions of Madame Butterfly at City Opera. And one of the things that I find really fascinating is that um, that you know the how much things have changed since 2009, and how um, you know back when I first started. Uh, we were always expected to kind of like put up our fans and giggle and do all these caricatures that were very uninformed and ill-informed. And just even in the past, you know, two years, um, since like maybe right before the pandemic, things were really shifting to, I feel like all of a sudden directors were at least trying to be more uh, authentic or um, respectful of the Japanese culture and um, I just I, I'm really happy to see that trend happening because it's amazing just in the in you know 10 or 12 years how much things have changed. How much of, of that do you think comes from other works like the Mikado or the Ping Pang Pongs or I mean how much of those mannerisms uh, transcend Butterfly as a work and, and come from other works in the repertory. What do you think? Often directors confuse and and uh, maybe something that it that should be rooted in Chinese opera or or that those kinds of elements like like the ping pang pong or and and then what you would do maybe in Madame a Butterfly they're they're confusing the the styles so it's very frustrating and it's very um, demoralizing as well. But couldn't you argue just to play devil's advocate that like the ping pang pong, those are sort of commedia del arte characters that Puccini is just sort of grafting on. So they, they are these archetypal characters. They're just not archetypes from Peking opera, but but you know he is still trying, they, they still have a place within the dramatic arc of his story. Um, they just, you know, because there's a limitation of actual Asian, representation out there, it comes across to us perhaps as caricatured or, or uninformed, but you know, maybe that wasn't his intention, but we, we are seeing that that archetype also is um, another place that's quite powerful in terms of reinforcing that. But you know, again, that only works if the audience is also aware of that dynamic. And I think maybe if, if we are now in a multiracial society where people don't have that familiarity and don't don't know of that tradition of, of commedia dell'arte. So when they come to it, they just take it at, at face value. So is there something to be said then about how archetypes work? And if the archetypes don't ring true with an audience that they become sort of creative dead ends. What do you guys think about that? Well, I don't know. Uh, Puccini made uh, a few revisions. I think this was talked before in your previous discussion, but uh, when uh, he removed um, a lot of uh, racial remarks in the act, in act one, when uh, Pinkerton makes fun of um, the Japanese food and Japanese names and Japanese movements and all those Japanese characters. So that would have been a lot more offensive if they stayed in the standard version now, but those are pretty uh, offensive and uh, came from ignorance. And I'm very glad that they are not in the, uh, in our version anymore. But if a director was trying to villainize Pinkerton, would it be appropriate to keep that in? Oh, I, I mean, the tenor and we all have to argue <laughs> very hard about that, about that decision, I guess. Yeah. I think what's important to note is that depicting a villain and having evidence for that on the stage is one thing, but when it also serves to harm maybe folks who are in the cast who are of those origins or people in the audience who are, who are of, you know, Asian heritage, um, it, it's, I don't, I don't think that's right. So there needs to be a, a balance and a reason and, but also taking into consideration many of these other elements as well for opera production. So that sounds like a pretty clear line in the sand that even though somebody is a bad guy, sometimes what they're saying can be not necessarily directed at a character to make them look like a bad guy, but sometimes is actually critical of the audience or commentary on something social that is a, a, a truth or an uncomfortable truth or a stereotype, um, but, but can be directed at the audience instead of at another character. 
do you think that's important for us to reframe some of these these villains? Do you do you see other examples of that in other operas that that um, you know where this dynamic is in place? I don't know that I would not lean into the villainy because I think it's 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 interesting. I think Puccini is very critical of the American side, um, and and. Um, if I try to look at it from the, the time and, and maybe more with a, the optimistic view would think of like, a, I watched this uh, documentary on Van Gogh in Japan and he was so enchanted by, by Japan in a really deep and sincere way. And yes, he would copy the, the wood blocks of the artist, but, but he really wanted to integrate, integrate what he thought the values of Japan was. And he thought about it all the time. And, and uh, maybe back then it it wasn't complete exotification. I think also, I think of Puccini in this time as, you know, there were these huge waves of Italian immigration and they were going to the US and, and a lot of Italian people will say, oh, my rich uncle in the US will solve my financial problems or something like that. There's like a joke about rich, uh, having that. So it's like, there's there's this also imaginary U US space that is, is could be not necessarily terrifying, but it is something to note, like it, it is on its way to becoming uh, another huge empire um and i think yeah that that's interesting and another thing that you got you guys had said that made me think about is the just respect for the the craft of performance aside from um appropriation or or, or whatever is if you're going to ask someone to sort of shuffle their feet the way a lot of directors have you need training to do that um there's a there's a theater company in the u.s called city company and they worked with tashi suzuki's company um in, in Japan, so they actually trained and performed with him and they've brought their practice, which is half viewpoints based on dance and half this Japanese theater training. And it takes a long time to be able to do that <laughs> and to be able to do that well. Um, and, and I think uh, just for like a sheer respect of the craft that we have as theater makers and uh, is to not throw someone on stage and just say, just do this, do this, do this, do this. Like, how could how if you're going to do that? How can you live it? How can you understand why those things happening? How do you, how do you understand their connections to classical Japanese theater or what whatever you need to make that a little bit more um, full and and understood on a sort of molecular, corporeal level? I think that would be really helpful. Also, I did a production um, a couple of years ago where they brought in a Japanese uh, movement specialists and they were there for our whole rehearsal period. And after you know. <laughs> So many hundred uh, butterfly shows I've done, I learned so much from just spending two weeks with them. And I was like, oh my goodness, like how have I been doing this wrong for 10 years? And it's, it's. I mean, I think it's a huge help to bring people in who really understand the movement and the culture. And I think a lot of that also plays to that you need to be wearing kimono, like the right type. So you can't move your your legs from your hips it has to be from the knees and wearing the right getta as well like the shoes um and feeling that restriction of the big obi the big belt that goes across um your solar plexus as well so all of that will play into the portrayal but also thinking yeah incorporating the technique the vocal technique it's it's um it's challenging because it's so multifaceted so I, I guess I'm just curious to see if uh, any of the artists have any questions for, for our panelists as well. And for those listening uh, out there in the universe, if you want to drop any questions you have for our artists or our panelists into the chat, we can also ask them as well. So feel free to drop those into the chat. Um, I have a question for you all. Um, something I've been thinking a lot about lately in um, my own advocacy and my own um, work is, um, the way we choose to identify ourselves versus the way that others see and identify us and how that specifically um, affects our careers and the way people see us in the industry. And I would love for you all to talk about um, how that has affected your career um, and or it still affects your career. I have this career because of all of these that we are discussing. So I've um... I started my career in the uh, mid nineties. And when I started out um, there, I believe there were not too many Asian 
uh, American or Asian singers working in the industry yet, but I, um, uh, but I believe uh, early 2000, uh, I started seeing a lot uh, more Asian names. And um, I started out uh, singing uh, standard roles, uh, Mimi and Mikaela and Adina, all those things, Mozart roles. But once I started singing Butterfly, of course, I was hired only for um, Butterfly. And I shared this briefly yesterday, but for the last 20 years, there have been only two American companies who had me uh, sing. Uh, something other than butterfly for so it's a long time 20 years is a long time and two contract is very little so I made my choice and I went into that direction but if I have a chance to advise uh, younger artists or my students I don't know how I would advise um, I also waited uh, quite a long time to start singing this role because I knew that I was going to be pigeonholed but then um if um, they can wait out to sing this role, if they can choose not to sing this role is also a smart choice maybe. Um, that's my uh, sharing. So before I entered opera, I started out as a, an orchestral musician where your body is not mm, seen. That's not what you're judged on. Uh, and then, and then moved into theater and then moved into opera. And when, for the few seconds that I was, you know, learning the craft of being on stage, I was really into Shakespeare and I'd looked back on it and thought, okay, I was also not that great at Shakespeare perhaps or new to the whole, the whole theater machine, but um, I think I played a silent servant, um, uh, a non-silent servant. Uh, and, you know, like eventually I got to play like the sister of, of, uh, of, of Octavius, maybe in Caesar or something like that. But um, yeah, just trying to think of what, what, what is that? Um, and I think as a director, because I've heard these stories of being pigeonholed, I care so much that I, I want to be um, looked at for how I work, how my imagination works, how, how I think. And you know, a lot of the uh, positive things are happening now when people are trying to engage new, um, you know, more diverse voices. But I think there's there also has to be care in and how you do that. I think the danger is a lot of times when people are hiring a director of color or a woman, they want them to be there to fix the problems of the production, and so that weight is on your shoulders, and you're not expected to just do your art. Uh, you're expected to address this sort of vast beast of kind of what's wrong with the world <laughs> and what's wrong with institutions. And that's a lot uh, to put on the shoulders. And I don't know that institutions realize that that, that happens. So, um, you know, I've had a couple of, of bad experience where that expect, uh, bad experiences where that expectation I felt was implicitly there or explicitly there. And there was a point where I said, okay, I don't know that that's where I, I want to be. and it's too much right now and maybe should I step aside from it? But on the other hand, I think I heard um, in another panel, you guys talking about how there's also this pull because it's a responsibility and you want to um, care for the community and help move things along for, for different, you know, different movements or different um, uh, ways of thinking. So it's it's a tough, tough decision to, to make and tough tough to know what streams to follow. There's, there's definitely this pressure, I think, as, as Asian Americans or and folk, you know, any sort of non-European folks that if there is a depiction of your culture on stage, that you sort of have to go for it because if not you, then someone white's gonna do it and gonna you know, make a mess of it. So even if it doesn't speak to you artistically, there might be pressure to, to take that on. Um, that is, <clears throat> I don't know if we can ever even avoid that dynamic, except by just commissioning more artists of color to make their own work in their own voices. Um, sorry, Tay, I interrupted you. No problem. Um, I think it's only really been in the last five or so years that I have um, publicly, start, publicly started to identify um, myself in like a, a biography or in an introduction of my heritage, of, of my of my gender, of my otherness that isn't white or isn't hetero or isn't cisgendered. Um, because I think it's important 
for representation, just to know that, you know, we exist and we are in this art form. Um, and but at the same time, I was also starting to create theater and create this, in, like create my own shows and interdisciplinary work. So I've now been kind of balancing both worlds of the more traditional conventional industry and then this theater hybrid opera world as well. So, but I guess before, um, like I would say about the first 10 years or so of my career, it was, it was just easier to anglicize my name. Like when I introduced myself, um, play down the fact that, you know, I was Japanese because they were often like very microaggressive racist jokes that would follow, um, in any kind of given professional setting. Um, but, um, I, I used kind of my sort of whiteness, sort of not whiteness, depending on how people read me, um, and how people were familiar with the, my Japanese surname and, and my first name. But, um, if, if I could use that to my advantage. So I was in, in a sense, just whitewashing myself, trying to see if I could get ahead in the career that way. But I feel like I've actually had more success by just being completely honest um, to myself and to the industry. But I'm just, it's just happening in a different way. Like I'm not singing the Lucia or the Violetta or whatever, you know, at big houses, but, um, you know, I'm still still working within the canon and I still but I also have this space where I can have a have a voice artistically um, and create works and talk about these really important, difficult conversations like with you folks um, and to also create space for others through my company. So it's kind of like a, a hybrid model now, I feel like. And that feels at least fulfilling and it feels honest. I hear whenever I hear uh, compliments from the audience or other people in the industry that my butterfly was believable because of the way I looked, I always comment that there's nothing wrong with white singers singing butterfly. That's the only way I get to sing Mimi too. Please accept them too. So I think this is constant fight that we have to do. Uh, we actually have a, a session on casting coming up. So I know we have a couple questions in the chat um, about this, but we're dedicating a whole session on casting and how do we cast and how do we look at these racialized roles. So stay tuned for that as an upcoming conversation. Um, we did have a great question um, in the chat, um, questioning this dynamic that we talked about, um, Giselle and I talked about of these sort of archetypes, racialized archetypes in these operas. Um, and sort of the weight being on the people from those cultures to come in and, and take ownership and sort of fix the problems. So uh, a question from the audience is what can institutions do to make sure that that burden isn't on those, those people to always have to come in and fix the old racist problems, depictions of your specific culture, as opposed to coming in and doing a fantasy work that has nothing to do with race or, or, or your race or your culture that's just, um, a great opera. My vote is always for the fantasy work because I would I would say that when you say, "Oh, I'm bringing this artist in because they're this, and they will do this for me," that is a sort of a one to one correlation. But when you bring the artist in and you say, "You do what you want," you talk about love like a human. You you talk about tragedy or grief like like a human. Then there's the potential for growth that goes like that goes like this, <laughs> just e exponential. And I think, you know, when I think of, okay, what does, what does my background having lived in four different continents or having different religions, um, how does that affect the way I live or think? Uh, and it's not existing on this one-to-one -one level. It's like, oh, it's easier for you to understand the other, or I, I, I like to play with time. My understanding of time is, is, is can, it shifts or, I also think that objects have their own life. Like maybe that comes from some, some background. Uh, so like, I love, you know, like puppetry or moving objects. And I think those are ways where people coming from different, whatever countries, backgrounds, religions, uh, disciplines, um, 
that's how they can manifest in them, themselves. And I think that's the beauty of it, 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 just letting it go, letting it transform into something unexpected. So I'd say, yes, plenty of fantasy um, is, is fantastic. But what do we do with a work like Turandot or Butterfly or you know, Othello? Nina, go ahead. I wasn't so much gonna talk about what we do with the specific operas, but more about what institutions can do to help so that we're not, um, the weight is not put on us. Um, and I think the first thing that that kind of needs to be addressed um, now, from now on, is like this tokenization of what's happening. And are you bringing these people in as a token or are you doing the work yourself and then letting them, you know, advise or help with the work? Um, you know, I was recently talking to a certain opera company who really wanted to produce something for API Heritage Month. And so I went in to go advise with them and I, I sat down and I said, okay, so, so what are, what are you uh, thinking about? And they said, well, we haven't really thought of anything yet. What are you, what do you think we should do? And so I think oftentimes a lot of this work, they think, you know, institutions think that if they're bringing people in, that we can do the work for them, but that's not where the work starts. The work has to start at your institution and then bring us in and we're happy to help and happy to discuss, but um, it can't solely be placed on us as a responsibility. This idea of creating space or creating opportunities for folks who are, who are racialized, who are equity seeking, um yes it's it's often i i notice the the predominantly white institutions are just saying here's the work here's the opportunity and all of it's felt um without any support because i think there is a hesitancy or um a worry that we might be stepping on toes you know it's like it's almost like the institution has is just kind of like waiting and has crept back and and doesn't know how to engage and doesn't realize that really like you said nina we want them to do the work and but then from that i would like to add that we want them to listen you know to listen to folks who are living these experiences who are the experts and i think all of that just takes so much more time we need to invest more time and more resources um, in having these conversations and having these consultations and then asking the institution to do the work, to implement those things, to take action. And then I think there can be a much more uh, release, of burden, oh, release of burden on the shoulders of these equity seeking folks that are involved in these operas and which are often the artists or the director. I think um, one practical thing that could also be done, uh, there are, such things as equity audits. Um, I have a lot of friends that work in education and there was someone I met a uh, few years ago. I can send this information to you all uh, later, but there is such a thing as getting an equity audit that many nonprofits have started to do, that many arts organizations have started to do. And I think at an institutional level, that's a very good place to start. Um, to have an independent organization come in and kind of take a look at everything. And it can be a rude awakening. I was, uh, I was talking to this friend about it and they were saying it is kind of a rude awakening sometimes because you do have, you know, she did one of a, a dance company actually. <laughs> um, and uh, they did have this perception of seeing themselves one way and the audit kind of showed some difficult things and that's hard that's that's very hard um for anybody but i think it takes that burden away from the artist and i think there's a lot of importance in doing that and um in not putting it on the artists and performers to do that work for them so just food for thought well, nicholas that's great i just wanted to reiterate that it's like those equity audits are um are working at the the systems, right? Like the systemic uh, operations and values of the company, and even like the board. Thinking about the board of directors, which is so integral to the financial well-being of a company and that like historic financial well-being. So that really also needs to happen too, because if you just do it project by project, often you get stuck because you can't go past 
you know, certain levels of leadership or something, or it's like, oh, no, we don't have time or we don't have the money or you have to get approval from this person, this person, this person. So it's like you need to start at the top. You need to start at the board and it needs to in be integrated all the way down. So thanks for bringing that up. I think, yes, long term, building long term relationships are, are great so that it's not a band aid. Um, I was thinking how, you know, as as much as I love seeing change and I'm still surprised when I see a production team that's all women in cinema or whatever, or or a cast where, you know, like there are a number of people in, in lead roles of color or something like that. And I, or especially this woman thing, I'm like, oh, why am I surprised that it's not entirely men? So we're so used to having seen for hundreds of years, um, the art space controlled by by men, I, I would love for us to not not be surprised anymore. Um, I think institutions might not also be aware that, you know, as as the efforts to, to all of a sudden diversify um, in a space that's not typically diverse, it does have growing pains and the institutions might not be aware, but I've been told by even some friends, oh, so-and-so just got the job because of this, because they're this, because they're this, because they're this. That's, um, you know, like even a friend to, to my face and like, then then I think, oh, well, have all the other people just gotten the jobs because they're 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 either, you know, like straight white men who have been running the theater for a long time, but it's not it's not seen that way. So I think some some awareness of that, that 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 is happening. Um, and and if you make it en enough of normal, then then hopefully that kind of reaction is, is not possible anymore. And then to attach attach on, I think universities are also great allies potentially, because there are all of these people who've devoted their life to studying this or that or critical theory or feminist studies or queer studies or or a, a lot of things and they can just sort of walk walk in and uh, not that easily. But, you know, I think they're often very generous with with all the research that they've done and and happy to share with arts organizations. And I think it, it's been great to see that you guys have done that through this discussion series. And and there are plenty of universities around Boston specifically. And I think that that would be a great source. I know we're, we're getting a little tight on time, but I, I do have one final question that I'd love to pose to everybody, artists and panelists alike. Um, you know, a lot of my work with, with Final Bow for Yellow Face is questioning um, both the intention of the artists as well as the impact, um, questioning caricature, questioning um, who's in charge of choosing the images that we are presented with. And I guess the question I would love for everyone to, to think about and answer is maybe, or like, what are some of the real life implications of these archetypes and stereotypes that we encounter in our repertory? Um, you know, how how has how has a, the geisha fantasy affected how you've been treated off stage? Um, how have you know other archetypes of being an American or being um, an opera singer <laughs> or whatever whatever? Um, you know, you can fall into whatever archetypes you personally can fall into as part of your identity. How have some of those things translated from the opera stage in our canon and our repertory to maybe a personal experience for yourself off stage? I was uh, walking down Brick Lane with my my partner, and we came across a chess player. Uh, he saw that we were together, and he was like, "Oh, I love my wife's Asian or Chinese. I, I love I love her because she brings me lunch. She doesn't complain that I'm." gone all the time she she doesn't smoke she doesn't swear um and and she's you know just so so good to me and and I was like well and he sort of looked at my partner and stopped talking to me and was like yes do you do you agree of course my partner was like yes I I I, I, I love my partner she's great but but I was like no I'm, I used to chain smoke uh I lie all the time I wanted to sort of really push against what this guy was was wanting to see in this whole population. I try not to lie, um, and I don't chain smoke anymore. But but I think you know wanting to sort of push back against what he was saying. An archetype that I seem to run into a lot, actually, specifically being an opera singer, is I have an entire other life that is incredibly athletic and is very enduro sport. And the number of times I've been at races or talking to other outdoorsy folks and they hear I'm an opera singer and they're like oh I never expected to see a thin opera singer and it's just like yeah there's all shapes and body sizes and just like it it the, the Bugs Bunny Brunhilde is not 
the standard at all. And it's, it's interesting because I, I still get it uh, quite often from those outside, but I also get it still from within the opera community too, of just like, what are you gonna do on your day off? Oh, I'm gonna go for a run. And that question is like, why? Just like, cause it's what interests me. And I, it, again, there's so many different types of people who are doing opera right now that at this point, I, I, I would love to be surprised by seeing how many different other spaces and life areas that folks that we sing with love to do on their off time. Like, I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, and then the other archetype though, of course, is I'm Hispanic and I very rarely do I, am I ever cast or in a production or even in school when I was in school with more than two or three other Latinx folks. And just, I am still trying to figure out how that, how that one happened and how much of it is uh, just a lack of opportunities for Latinx folks to come into classical music versus how much of it is cultural as well. My parents just have no experience with classical music. So I, I like how far back do we need to go in these generations to realize that like it's, it's there and it's available to them. I remember Phil at one, one session we did together, you, you, you had said, you know, how has the geisha archetype um, influenced your life, my life. And I, I really, you know, never had thought about it before. And I don't know that it necessarily has, but then you mentioned something about how like, well, maybe the two archetypes are either like turned out or the geisha, right? Like if you've got butterfly or turned out, you've got like this mad Asian woman, you know, or this sweet little Asian woman. And then I think about like, oh, well, like how many times have I been called a tiger mom or stuff like that? And it's, it's amazing how um, what we see in the media and on stage then translates to how people view us in our society. It just reminds me of the, one of the earlier points in our conversation and, and the moment when Butterfly starts criticizing her own gods for being fat. Uh, and, I'm lazy. Yeah. yeah, and I feel like then that's the moment when she's like fully integrated a, a perspective that's not hers and I think when when you start thinking of things like tiger mom that's that's no longer you or even Asian American because I think you know obviously you guys have spoken to it before uh, uh, just like German is nothing like Italian you know Korean and and Thai and uh, all very different <laughs> um, so the fact that you are thinking of oh Asian that's like it's are you embodying the already the perspective of of the other that is imposed? We go ahead, Taya. Oh, I was just gonna say. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go quick. That sometimes these stereotypes that are imposed on us, we want to push back, and like like you were saying, Giselle, and that I've I've often ex um, experienced like almost swinging from extreme to extreme and wanting to be like you know aggressive and and that kind of thing and being very and having anger inform that um and that's all well and done in the moment i think but it, i think it also speaks to that we are very complex people like everyone is complex and has many ways and want in the way in which they want to express themselves and that we change and that we grow and we evolve over time and that you know the way in which maybe we've uh judged someone even in the past or a stereotype of of a you know, based on their their ethnicity or their gender or or their ability that they also have the ability to, to change and grow too. So I feel like it's also, even though there's a lot of emotions and uh, associated with the experiences that I've had, there's a lot of like empathy that I'm growing, not only for myself, like gentleness for myself, but also for, for others around me too. You know, the impact of all of this is my career, and I always call it curse and a blessing. So I got to travel around the world because of all this. And here at the university, uh, my nickname by my students is uh, Beautiful Dragon. And I have many Asian students, and I take no offense because I know what they mean by that. And, you know, we had one question, a couple questions in the audience about what is the word meaning the cultural worship of another culture that you mentioned. Can you share that word with, with our audience? Sade chui. Chui is ism. So sade ism. Uh, so I think rough English translation I found was toad, 
toadyism or flankyism, but that's not really correct. It's more of worshiping other culture, thinking, putting it more superior than your own. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for all of our artists and panelists for joining us today. Thank you also to BLO for hosting us and for everybody who tuned in. Um, I think the, the sort of closing message that I'm getting from a lot of the panelists is that, um, yes, there are archetypes, stereotypes in you know, every work of art, and it's our responsibility as living creatives today to figure out ways to twist the ones that, that may not ring true anymore, question them, um, and, and every time we present a show that is repertory, that we have the opportunity to redefine what some of these stereotypes and archetypes mean for our current moment. So I think that's both the, the beauty and the responsibility and, and sometimes the curse of us working in the performing arts and working with this repertory. So it's, it's both a responsibility and a blessing. So um, as we continue to hope for a, a long life for this beautiful opera that it seems like everyone loves this opera, the, at least the music, and uh, it seems like there's, there's a will and a curiosity to find ways to keep it moving forward into the future. So. Um, thank you so much to everybody for being a part of this. Um, we do have an upcoming session about casting um, coming up uh, in the coming months. So if you just go to the Butterfly Process website, you can see more information about that. Um, and of course, uh, feel free to tune to the other sessions that uh, you might have missed before. They're all available on operabox.tv. So thank you again so much for tuning in.